Yep, it's on. Thank you guys for coming out. I really appreciate it. Um, if you have a question or you can't hear anything, just shout out and I'll stop. Um, I'm going to show a little bit of my work. I'm going to end with the work that's upstairs in the gallery. So I'm going to talk about that a lot. But I wanted to start in just kind of giving an overview of, of my entire practice as an artist. So we're going to kind of start in the beginning where I grew up in Pennsylvania. So I grew up way out in the country. It was kind of a rural, agrarian part of Pennsylvania. So my first photographs were largely based on the landscape around me, and, and I looked to things in my immediate vicinity for inspiration. So this is actually my neighbor's house. Um, I was really influenced early on by American modernism, particularly the works of like Charles Sheeler, um, dealing with industrial and kind of arch uh, agricultural architecture. Charles Sheeler made a lot of photographs, too, in, in addition to his paintings, sometimes in reference for his paintings. And he actually lived not far from where I grew up in Pennsylvania. And so I really looked to him as a kind of a role model for what I wanted my early work to be. He had that ability to sort of combine abstraction or the looks of abstraction with the content of a kind of social realism. And so I was really kind of interested in that. And you can see a lot of the influences of him in my early work. It's very structured very rigid, working with color, um, but really reductive in terms of the composition, the use of color, the use of light. And just again, looking at sort of agricultural architecture all around me. Um, I was working with a four by five view camera at the time, which is a large format camera. It allows you a lot of control over the picture. Um, 
really kind of minimal aesthetic. And then as I sort of progressed, I started experimenting more with weather and light and color and things like that while still kind of focusing on things that were all around me. So this is like a McDonald's sign seen in three different ways. Church architecture, again, light playing a really important role in the pictures. At the same time, I was actually working in black and white also. So this is my niece who I photographed. Um, this is still in college, and at this point I made the step up to an 8x10 view camera, which is a much larger, pretty um, rigorous camera. And so she was about four years old when, when she was able to be still enough to have that kind of interaction and I could make these kinds of pictures. Um, this was actually the third picture I made with that camera. Um, she's got a little tattoo around her belly button. Um, yeah. <laughs> so she grew up in the house that I grew up in. So a lot of the pictures sort of refer back to my own childhood and I used her as a sort of surrogate for things that I experienced. Um, but we were together a lot and um, so we would just kind of, I would babysit her, we would photograph. She actually fell asleep while I was trying to make a picture here. Um, but I like this picture better. Yeah. So at this time I was influenced by Sally Mann's work. If anybody knows her, this is one of her photographs. She photographed her children in Lexington, Virginia. Um, this is a picture called Hay Hook, and I borrowed from her pretty heavily, I think. So this is my kind of hayloft picture. This is all on my property. And then I was also really influenced by a teacher of mine at MICA, who's Connie and Bowden, and she photographed models underwater. And so she really kind of abstracts the body and sort of gets graphic with things. So actually, it's hard to understand the orientation, but she's underwater and the body goes underwater too. And then the surface of the water kind of cuts off the figure a little bit. Um, but her pictures had this really kind of great tension and psychology behind them. And so even though my pictures were totally different, I tried to sort of utilize some of that. But mine are a little bit more playful, you know. <laughs> Yeah, this was one of the only times that I bribed her to do a picture. She had cut a hole in her blanket and, and I had seen her poke her head through. Um, but so I just asked her to do it again. Um, and this picture, a lot of people have different interpretations of what this picture kind of looks like. I've heard a lot of religious things or other kind of things. But for me, I think the reason it resonated with me as a photograph was because of this. <laughs> so. <laughs> Hopefully you guys know E.T. Um, so this was actually the first movie I saw as a child. Um, and it, and it kind of stuck with me. And as you'll see a little bit later in the slides, um, American movies are a big influence on my work. So no, it's just a still from the movie. Yeah. So this picture um, was an important one for me. So I want to talk about it just a little bit. This was made just after 9-11. And around this time, I'm still in college, and I remember one of my professors told me that my pictures were very American. And I didn't really understand what that meant, although I took it as a compliment at the time. Um, but so this picture, I sort of made just in response to the events that are taking place and looking at things around me. Um, but it also reminded me of American Gothic, the really famous American painting by Grant Wood. Um, so we have like the pitched roof that's similar and of course that austere kind of look. Um, but I remember learning about this painting and being reminded of the, the repetition of the pitchfork in his overalls. You can see the same pattern repeat. And then the pattern of her dress repeating itself in the windows. And so if we look back at my picture, again, we have that same sort of pitched roof, but we have the echo of the color scheme, the red, white, and blue from the flag back into the painting of the actual house. So for me, this was a really important picture because it was the first time I could make a landscape picture that referred to history and things that are going on um, in the political climate at the time. So this is just a little sidebar um, just to give you an understanding of the way I make work. So I made this picture for a contest, actually. Southwest Airlines was turning 30 years old, and so 
they had a contest to represent the number 30 in some way. And so, you know, I made this picture. I actually, so Route 30 runs east and west in Pennsylvania. So I took a south sign from, I don't know where, somewhere else, and I put it up there, <laughs> and then I photographed it. And I ended up winning the competition, and the prize was 30 airline tickets. So I kind of dipped out of school and like started traveling all across the United States and making photographs in places where I'd never been. And for me, that was really important because I was making different work than, than everything else I saw in college. Um, and it also taught me to look at the larger culture rather than talking about one kind of specific place. Um, and so a lot of my college pictures were just traveling around um, and looking at just anything. Um, this is a cell phone tower disguised as a tree. You guys see those often now. And so this way of working has really kind of stuck with me. So even though I don't fly as much anymore, I still travel around the country quite a bit. So I, I sleep out of my car, and I make, I've made seven cross-country trips since I was 19. This is when I made my first one. So there, like, I got my little bed on the side, and then cameras and food and things like that. So a lot of my work happens like this, and I'll sleep at Walmarts, things like that. Um, you're actually allowed to sleep at Walmarts for 14 consecutive nights. That's why you see like a lot of Winnebago's and stuff there. They actually welcome people to do that. And they're super safe and there's food and all that good stuff. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's good to know. Yeah. Yeah, there you go, yeah. All right. So these are just some pictures. This is out in South Dakota, the Badlands National Park. This is Whiskey Town, California. So I had researched a few specific places that I wanted to travel, but really I was just allowing myself the freedom to go anywhere and make any pictures I wanted. But what started developing was this consistency between man's relationship to nature and how development and technology was sort of intruding or intersecting in an interesting way. So this was just after, oh man, it was maybe Hurricane Andrew? Maybe? One of those down in Florida. Yeah. There's a painter, painting um, characteristics. I do. I mean, yeah, I mean, I actually, when I look at my own slides, I often think they don't look photographic, they look kind of painterly, and, and I don't know if that's just a sort of aesthetic sensibility that I have, like I know a picture's there when it looks like that, but it's not intentional. This is out in Idaho. Um, these are high school graduation years that they paint on the mountain every, every graduating class. They started, in, I think, in 1923 or something. Um, yeah. And then I was also making portraits, um, which I do from time to time. You won't see too many in the show, but um, mostly of people at work. So this is the guy who actually polishes the stars on the Hollywood Walk of Fame. He's missing his right leg, so he actually, it's much easier for him to sort of shuffle along. Um, he's a really kind of interesting guy. This is a man carving a teddy bear out of a redwood tree. This is in Redwood National Forest out in California. It's a girl folding sweaters in a mall. Yeah, it's a Benetton. I don't know if they still have those, but yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Stephen knows what I'm talking about. This is a doorman reading a newspaper. This is a, I lived in this building for a time in Baltimore, so this was my doorman. I also, um, I lived in Maine for a little bit after college, um, so I'm going to show some pictures of when I lived up there. I lived on the coast. Um, so this is a, a man digging for clams in a bay at low tide. So with this work, this was kind of the first time I, I tackled like one specific place and I wanted to see how the landscape affected people's way of life. Um, 
So because of its geographic location, certain things are, you know, are applicable there that aren't other places. This is a salmon farm just off the coast. Actually, the left-hand side is Canada. The right is still the US. And just looking for like quirky things that I don't know. So I kept seeing these things on trees. Does anybody know what these are? No, I didn't. So they have porcupines up there. And if they, they climb up the tree and they'll eat the, the leaves off the trees and it'll kill the trees. So they put this shiny reflective stuff and they can't climb up it. So they just fall so they can't destroy the tree, which I think is interesting. <laughs> so it's strange. You didn't know porcupines went up trees. I didn't either. <laughs> This is a man skinning a moose. So hunters will bring in the moose or the deer and he'll sort of skin it and cut it up and give them the meat. Yeah. He did this all by hand, which is pretty strange. It took a while. And then just looking at the landscape, this is actually a blueberry field just in snow. Fire hydrant and ice. <laughs> and then I also sort of, um, we saw it in a little earlier slide where I had four pictures of the same place, but I've always sort of done that, like set up the picture and, and revisited the site again and again. So this is actually a bay near East, Eastport, Maine. And so this is high tide and then the same exact picture made at low tide. Um, the tidal shifts up there are really extreme, something like 25 feet. Um, which I didn't know when I first moved there, and I tried to go make pictures of the water, and one day it was there, and the next day it wasn't there, and I didn't really understand. <laughs> What's that? It is, actually, yeah, yeah, yeah. This is um, Carrying Cove Place, which is in that, yeah. Um, so these are all pictures of that. I, I revisited that site a number of times, and looking at the way that weather and light um, affects the way the picture's read. So when I was living in Maine, I, I actually didn't know anyone. I didn't have a job. I was able to save up enough money that I could just live and make photographs. Um, so I really, I mean, aside from making pictures, I looked at a lot of books and I watched a lot of movies. And so one of the books I had with me was um, a photographer called Joel Sternfeld. He has a book called On This Site, um, which examines the American landscape that has been stained by violence long after the events have occurred. So this is one of Joel's pictures. Um, his work addressed the limitations of a landscape picture and what he called the issue of knowability. Like how much can we really know about a place just by looking at a picture of it? Um, so we might sort of see this picture in one way and then when we find out that this is actually the parking lot at Kent State University where the shootings occurred, we have a different reading of the picture because of the association of the events that took place there. Um, so I thought about this work often and um, I was watching a film one day, it's called Before Sunrise, it's by Richard Linkletter. And the film, you don't really need to know too much about it, but basically it follows around two people. They have one night to spend together and they travel throughout Vienna. And then, I don't want to give it away, but they have to split apart, and so the end of the film revisits all the places where the last night's events took place, but they're photographed in a new day with new light. Um, so these places that seem really mundane now take on a significance because you know what happened the night before. Um, so the end of this film sort of struck me as being very similar to Sternfeld's work, but there was one significant difference. This was entirely fictional and his was nonfiction, um, but I thought maybe I could sort of play with that in some pictures. So I decided that I would photograph places where American movies had been filmed um, as a way to sort of talk about some of the same issues, but in a fictional way. Um, so I started traveling around and photographing places that are sort of iconic in the American landscape because of the association with a narrative from a film. Um, and at first I didn't really know what I was interested in. I was just kind of going for it. And so a lot of the earlier pictures were, were films that were really important to me growing up in the 80s. So this is the Close Encounters of the Third Kind. 
really iconic place. But then I started to like look at sites that were very kind of specifically associated with these films. So, um, and the events were really important. So this is Bodega Bay where Alfred Hitchcock's The Birds was filmed. Yeah, so that's my picture. And this is like a still from the movie. So I'm using a lot of the language of the film to sort of make my own picture. So it's kind of the same format and things, even though this is actually a painting. Um, the bottom half of this frame is real and then the top half is just a painting. But I wanted to examine the ways that cinema contributed to our perception of a given place. Um, so I decided that I would use text to describe all the narratives that went along with each picture. Um, but I never said like, oh, this is from a movie. I never mentioned the movie at all. It's just sort of straightforward journalistic diction. Um, so I'm applying this really kind of classical documentary tool of, of photograph and, and text to something that's sort of fictional or filmic. Um, so like this one is the, I describe a Civil War battle scene. Um, so the associations is that, oh, well, we see the graves, this must be a Civil War battle site, and you see the mountains kind of burnt out. Um, but it's actually a picture that's made in California. And so once the, the viewer sort of sees that, oh, this obviously isn't a Civil War site, there's, they sort of understand that they're being misled or that the picture is being misrepresented by the text. Um, and that kind of plays into my interest in photography's role, not only in, in films, but in all kinds of media. This picture marked a, a kind of important turning point for me though in the project because this is a picture I made in Alcatraz Island and it was based on the film Escape from Alcatraz with Clint Eastwood. Um, and so up until this point I had been dealing with fictional narratives but this one is actually pretty true to the original story and it was filmed in the place where the events happened. So suddenly I was dealing with the actual event as much as I was talking about the movie and so I saw the potential there for some kind of confusion. So I, I started to look for films that were based on true stories and maybe they were faithful and accurate and maybe they weren't. Uh, like this bank, which was, in my presentation, it is robbed by Bonnie and Clyde. This is um, a bank out in Texas. So you read the text and you just assume that this is the bank. This is actually not the bank. But it's a bank that was filmed here. But the interesting thing about this place is that tourists visit this site often and they say, oh yeah, Bonnie and Clyde robbed this bank. And the owners, it's actually an art gallery now, which is a really beautiful space. But they have to tell people that no, no, it was just from the movie and they don't, they don't care. It's like, that's the bank. <laughs> um, that's yeah, so the context of this place, which has its own history, has actually been really, changed by the film, and so I want my presentation to kind of reflect that. Um, so right, a picture like this, it's like, that's the Alamo, right? Everybody knows the story. Um, and so the text that I provide is, is true. It's faithful to the story. Um, but this is not the Alamo. It's actually, <laughs> yeah. So this is the set that they built for John Wayne's movie, The Alamo. Um, which was built in 1959, and actually, this is the Alamo today. So you see, and there's a hotel behind it, there's all these things. So my picture, in some strange way, might actually represent more of the truth, because this has been restored, and now you have all these new developments, and so I, I like that sort of strangeness about it. Um, and when we think about history, maybe what something looks like might not seem like an important piece of information, but I think when we think about the perception of the world around us and how we rate, relate to places, how something looks is, is really important. Uh, All the President's Men is a film that I, you know, that I think strongly influenced our understanding of a particular event. So I wanted to make a picture of that. So this is a still from All the President's Men, 1976, and this is my photograph. Um, so this is the parking garage where Bob Woodward met with Deep Throat to talk about Nixon and the Watergate scandal. And so for 30 years, this is like the representation of what 
we thought those events looked like, meeting in secret in a darkened place. Um, and so this sort of really became the only way to understand that. We actually didn't know until 2005 where they even met or who it was. And by that point, like, I've actually been to the other parking garage, but it doesn't feel the same. Um, I like mine better, yeah. Um, I didn't make a picture. I'm going to make a picture there, though. Um, but so as I, as I continued with this project, I understood that that people are aware that films lie, and, and you know, I was, I was concerned that if people thought, once they got the hook, like, the, oh, it's movies, that they might just think, oh, well, I can't trust any of it. And I really wanted to blur the line between truth and fiction, so I started interjecting pictures that had nothing to do with movies that were true. And so the audience would have to really sort of decide what's real, what's not. So, this was one of the first pictures where I did that. Um, this was made in Albuquerque, New Mexico. This is where um, a woman spilled coffee on herself, no. right, and got burned really badly. I'm going to read you the text just because it's kind of awful. Um, so 79-year-old Stella Liebeck ordered a cup of coffee from the passenger seat of her grandson's car at this McDonald's drive through on February 27, 1992. Her grandson stopped the car so she could add cream and sugar, and in the process of removing the lid, she spilled the drink into her lap. The coffee, which was served at a temperature over 180 degrees, caused third-degree burns and scalding over 6% of her body, including her thigh, groin, and buttocks. Stella was taken to the hospital where she stayed for eight days while undergoing a number of painful skin graft operations. So, we actually hear this story as, as an example of like frivolous lawsuits because we're like, oh, you spill, the coffee's hot. But it's actually when you hear the details, truthfully, you understand that, that the story's been completely manipulated by the media. And photography's role within that manipulation is important to me. So I use this as an example of, of something that even though we know it as a true story, our understanding of it is actually quite something else, um, quite false. So, so I, liked, I likened this sort of picture to a Hollywood movie because it's entirely fake. Um, so as I continued, I photographed places that people would sort of instantly recognize as being like, yes, I know this place, I know what happened there. So this is Three Mile Island in Pennsylvania where the nuclear meltdown occurred. And you can see the, the one thing is no longer smoking, that's the one that melted down. And then I also liked interjecting stories where people maybe didn't know if I was, you know, is this real, is this not real? So I look for places like this. This is, um, this is John D. Long Lake, which is outside of Union, South Carolina. So do we remember Susan Smith, the, the girl, the woman who drowned her children? So I'll read the text to you on this one too. So on October 25th, 1994, Susan Smith allowed her car to drift into this lake with her two sons trapped inside. The case received national attention when Smith claimed to have been carjacked by an African-American man before ultimately confessing nine days later. So most people know that part of the story, but my picture actually continues on. Uh, in 1996, two families drove to this spot to pay their respects and visit a nearby memorial that had been erected. Without warning, one of the vehicles began to drift into the lake with five passengers trapped inside. Two adults jumped in to save their children but drowned along with everyone in the car. So most people don't know that other story, and it seems too ironic and too strange to be real. Um, but so I sort of use things like that where people maybe don't know if I'm stretching the truth or not. This is another one that maybe people have heard of, but probably not. Um, November 22nd, this is the Gateway Arch in St. Louis, which most people recognize. Um, in 1980, a skydiver called his wife, actually left him a note, left her a note, and said, hey, meet me at the arch today, I'm gonna skydive under it. So she showed up with a camera to record it. Um, he ended up landing on top of the arch, and it was a super windy, stormy day, kind of like this picture, um, and his parachute caught, and he actually fell to his death right in front of her. Um, and this was, 
a lot, like a lot of the research has to do with whether or not this story is true. A lot of times people don't know, oh, it's, a, it's an urban legend. Um, but so I, I'm interested in that part of our culture and history where, where it overlaps with kind of rumor and mythology and folklore. This is another one that hopefully people remember. Do we remember Lorena Bobbitt? Yeah. This one's a little graphic. Um, so this is actually the patch of grass where they found his severed penis. Right. So I actually went through the case files in Virginia and found the photographs of the crime scene investigation and was able to trace down the place. Um, I did not know. <laughs> No memorial there. I should have put one up. Yeah. So the reason I show this work right before uh, Point Pleasant is because the work that I started making in Point Pleasant, West Virginia, which is the work upstairs, um, sort of had an overlap with this project. So I was researching this town called Point Pleasant, West Virginia, and in 2008 I drove there um, to make this photograph, which is the site of the Silver Bridge which collapsed on December 15th, 1967, killing 46 people. So you can see the train trestle in the back. This is where the bridge used to be. Here's a, a still of, of the collapse. So my interest in this particular event was that it was directly connected to a local myth called Mothman. So there was a movie about it, there was a book. Yeah, every, yeah everybody missed the book. Um, but so the backstory is this town had been at the center of national media attention for about 12 months before this bridge collapsed because people were reporting, reportedly seeing this bird-like creature and it kept sort of plaguing the town. There were a hundred accounts of this creature, some by police, all these things. There were UFO sightings, um, animal mutilations, disappearances, all these kind of weird things. So there's all this kind of weird psychic energy swirling around and the reason Mothman is linked to this bridge collapse is that after the bridge collapsed, the sighting stopped. It's a very kind of strange overlap of mythology and history, but so I went there, and so this is a drawing done, and this shows you the bridge at the bottom, and that's Mothman at the top. Uh, there's a little diner in town that is plastered with drawings that the kids make on the back of the menus of Mothman. So this kid, I don't know how old he was, he was like four, but they grow up and they know like this is part of our history, this is part of our mythology. Um, and so I was in the diner and I was looking at all these drawings and I kept seeing this place on the right hand side called TNT, this TNT area, which I didn't really know anything about. Um, and at this point I was still looking to make a photograph that referred to these events. So, so I went to this local bookstore and this guy had this map, this kind of hand-drawn map that led me back to this old military installation, which they now called TNT. Um, so I drove out and this is like the first thing that I saw. Um, so these are concrete storage igloos where they used to store explosives during World War II. And so I didn't really know, I, you know, I wasn't thinking about starting a new project, I just sort of made these pictures. Um, and they told me there were about like a hundred of them, so I, I just sort of started making them and, and not really knowing what to do, but I decided, since there were so many, I would, I would set up this kind of typological study and just make the same picture over and over. Um, doing that sort of talks about, you know, the massive scale of it. So each picture is not super important, but the collective is really kind of important. Um, so I would make the same picture regardless of how much you could see of the thing, and sometimes you can't see it at all, but there's something just kind of lurking behind you. So when you see them in sequence, you sort of get the impression that something is there. And so, yeah. um, and so I was really going off just kind of guttural instinct, but also influenced by um, the Beshers, which are a husband and wife uh, photography team who started work in the 60s doing these typological studies of industrial architecture, which again, going back to the sort of American modernism, very much appeals to me. And also um, influenced by the work of William Christenberry, who's a Southern photographer he would return to the same sites over and over um, throughout his entire lifetime. And, and the idea of time and change 
really becomes important to the work because what I'm interested in is the history of the place and looking at it now and, and what's changed over time. So after I did some research, I realized that the place I was photographing is it's called the West Virginia Ordnance Works, which was built in 1942 and is about 8,000 acres. Um, you can barely see it, but in the top left-hand corner, that's the igloo area. At that time, it was completely open, but now it's been overgrown. Um, and so this was just one of many plants that cropped up in the 1940s as World War II was escalating. Um, I think before the war, the military controlled about 3 million acres of American soil, and then in three years, it jumped to 30 million acres. So they just sort of, you know, possessed these areas and then took them over. So this particular facility um, wasn't used to assemble bombs, but rather they just made the explosives and then they would be shipped by rail to places. So they produced about 400,000 pounds of TNT each day. And this is just one of, I think, 70 sites across the US. And so the process of creating TNT requires the use of a lot of hazardous chemicals. And so aside from the obvious danger of explosions, just the chemicals are, are pretty dangerous. So this is the original acid area, and then this is basically what it looks like today. So after the war, the land was turned over to the state of West Virginia um, for the creation of a wildlife management area. So a large system of ponds and wetlands was constructed as a makeshift habitat for waterfowl, migratory birds, other wildlife. Um, but in 1981, a ranger who was working for the Department of Natural Resources noticed red seepage. So the water was sort of turning red. Um, and so, maybe not surprisingly, it was discovered that the land and water supply were contaminated with explosives, heavy metals, um, all these kinds of things. Um, so in 1983, the site was added to the EPA's national priorities list, which ranks the most polluted, the most contaminated sites in the US. Um, and cleanup efforts began a, sh a, sh a short while later. Um, so on the left, it's hard to see, but this is one of their pictures. Um, they're actually setting fire to one of the old lines that carried the explosives just to sort of burn it off. And then on the right is a picture of raw TNT that was found just in the field. Um, and again, this is 50 years after the fact. So it's kind of crazy. Um, so although I had begun the project with sort of one thing in mind, I realized very quickly that the history of the place was really the thing that I wanted to concentrate on. And so I expanded out away from the igloos and just looked at the entire landscape. So a picture like this, I sort of see functioning on a couple different levels. On the, on the one hand, it just literally talks about how the place is used today. So this is just a campfire. So there's one campsite on the grounds. Um, but to me, it looks like this kind of infested landscape, this kind of oozing sore. And I also see it as a reference to UFO, UFO culture, like crop circles and things like that. So trying to sort of juggle all those things, the contamination, the history, but also the mythology and the history of the place really kind of became the, the challenge for the work. And it's difficult because oftentimes you can't photograph something that you can't see, right? Like this is one of the biggest problems with ecological photography is that something that is necessarily bad doesn't look bad. It might not even be visible. So this picture is an example of that. It just looks like a field with clouds, um, but that little tiny sign down there, it actually says um, danger explosives contamination buried under three feet soil cap, do not dig. So this is actually the, this is the burning grounds where they would, they would bury and burn off spec TNT. And so it's still there under there. It's actually their form of remediation. So it's just gonna stay there and they monitor the ground as long as somebody doesn't dig, they're fine. Um, but even the clouds in this picture aren't exactly what they seem to be. Um, it just looks like clouds, but it's actually exhaust from the Gavin Coal Power Plant, which is across the river in Ohio, which looks like this. Um, and this is the same plant that, I don't know if you guys know Mitch Epstein, he's a photographer. Um, he did a series called American Power, and this is, the same, this is his picture. But you can see um, the exhaust everywhere you go in TNT. So it actually, people use it as a guide to orient themselves, because it's due west across the river. 
So. so whereas you can see the sort of exhaust coming out, a lot of times the underground contamination, it's just not there. I know that it's there, so my job is to make pictures that refer to it in some way. So like this pond, this is a pond, believe it or not, um, but it's got the, this kind of toxic green sludge on it. So to me, the scum on the surface, while probably natural, refers to the contamination that I can't see. Or this mud runoff, which is probably just from the snow melting and, you know, but it looks not like you would want to swim in it. And this picture I made to refer directly to the red water seepage that was discovered. Um, this is just one particular pond that is surrounded by these trees that, I don't know much about it, but they lose these little red buds in the fall and it just sort of sits on the surface of the water. So one of the other ways I try to suggest the contamination and just the sort of violence in general is through metaphor, using dead animals, particularly deer, um, to not only show how the place is used as a hunting ground, because it is, um, but also as a surrogate for what you might find in an actual war site. Because I do sort of see this place as a battleground, not in the conventional sense, but like I made this picture and I sort of thought back to Timothy O'Sullivan's pictures of Gettysburg. This is the Harvest of Death, 1863. To me, it's sort of, you know, it's a metaphor. So some of these animals may have been legally hunted, but there's also a tremendous amount of poaching and dumping in this place because of the remoteness of the location. So everywhere you go, you see these kinds of things, and um, you hear guns all of the time. Um, and so you'll find traces of violence, and, and maybe it's natural, maybe it's unnatural, but to me, it, it doesn't matter. Like, I'm just all, I'm looking for anything that I can use to make a statement. Um, I only really photographed there in like the late and early winter. So on, on one level, it's, it's a logistical decision because the area is so overgrown that it's difficult to navigate, um, but it's also a psychological decision. I don't want pictures to be green or sunny. I want the, the sort of palette to be really reductive. Um, I only photograph like on overcast days um, to create this kind of bleakness. Um, on, or the Road, Cormac McCarthy's novel, is a big influence on these pictures. And I like the idea of this constant grayness of this post-apocalyptic landscape. It does present some challenges, so I, I get stuck in the rain quite a bit. This one was actually made in the rain under an umbrella, which is about a, it's about a two minute long picture. You can't really see that. But um, this sort of thing happens a lot. So that's my camera, this is the big eight by 10. Um, and I'm out, so it's an 8,000 acre site, so sometimes it just starts raining and I'm just stuck. I just have to sort of wait it out. Um, and there's not much I can do about it, but it's kind of nice. Sometimes the rain presents you with opportunities that you don't expect, so these are live bullets in a puddle. And so even though I've added in all these other contextual pictures, the series of TNT igloos is still the kind of spine of the project. So I've continually made those pictures over and over. For me, they, they really represent well the, the transgression between the natural environment and the built structure. So like they're concrete structures and then they're buried over with earth um, for insulation and for camouflage. And so again, as, as there are a hundred of them, there are exactly 100 of them. I've been to them all, photographed most of them. Um, as you'll see upstairs, like we have this really big grid installation. So you get a sense of the scale of the place and about how much explosives were actually produced in this place. And making pictures in this way in a sort of serial approach is, is very different than making just an individual picture. Every picture doesn't have to be super exceptional, but rather they function as a group. Um, and I've always really kind of enjoyed that way of working. So one of the things I have to struggle with is the, the landscape changes so much over time that I, it's a, actually really easy to get lost. So I had to make my own map. This is my map. Um, 
But so the, the entire place is called the magazine area, and basically I had to come up with a cataloging system, so I sort of I devised my own system. So each one is labeled with a very specific title, but it's just, it's just my own title. So I should say that some of these igloos are still live, meaning that there are still explosives and munitions stored in some of them. Um, some of them have been privately leased to companies and individuals who live in the area. Um, some of them store furniture in them. This one you can actually see, hopefully you can see inside, there are barrels of gunpowder and, and bullets and things like that. I never really considered it much, but um, in 2010, one of these igloos actually exploded. It contained about 20,000 pounds of unstable materials. So they closed off the area. This is quite far from my house, so I, I don't know. I just drive up there, and so I got there, and I made this picture. That was the extent of that trip. Um, but so I, I really wanted to get in and, and work my way in and continue my project, so I met with the guys at the um, Department of Natural Resources and the State Fire Marshal's Office, and basically worked my way back in, even though it was closed off. And so this is the picture that I made of the interior of the igloo. And so you can see that the roof has just been blown off and the trees have been burnt out. Um, so at first they were still sort of, um, they were escorting me in to make the pictures. This is what the inside of one looks like. And you can just sort of see with the roof blown off, it's quite different. Um, but they were actually stuck there for they had, to, they had to surveil the landscape 24 hours a day for, I think, like six months straight. And so these guys over Christmas actually had to live in this area. Um, so, you know, I got to know them pretty well. I got them Christmas gifts, and then they pretty much just let me do whatever I want, um, which was nice. So, um, so I've been able to continue despite the closure and just sort of continue. And, I mean, maybe that's a silly thing to do, but... I was sort of so heavily invested in the project that it just doesn't seem, I feel pretty safe there, despite all these other things. Um, so this is an igloo that's being cleaned out. So there's one gentleman who owns about 14 of them, including the one that blew up, and so he and his team have been cleaning these things out. This one's completely surrounded by water. This one took me quite a while to get. That dark sort of sludge that you see in the foreground and the bubbles, that's actually from me walking into the igloo and then walking back. Um, I tried originally to make this picture with a raft. I bought a raft, I went out and the raft popped. And I, had to, and I fell into the water. Um, but so I went back like two years later with uh, waders and I waded in and I made the picture. Yeah, it's very cold water. <laughs> uh, this is another interior. This is this this print is upstairs. So this one was just cleaned out. That's um those little triangles. It's actually um mouse poison. I don't know why they care about mice in there, but. <laughs> and so this is my one and only Mothman picture. So that's Mothman on there with some strange additions. Um, so. I sort of refer back to him a little bit because I'm, I am interested in it. Um, so Mothman is half man, half bird. And so I think there's an interesting connection to classical mythology and the story of the Minotaur, who was half man, half bull. And so the way it's most, most commonly interpreted is that he represents the duality of man, part violent animal, but also part intelligent creature who has a conscience. So you have that internal conflict that, that wants to wage war, but that also understands that killing might not be a moral act. And so I like the parallel between those two creatures because I'm really just trying to use the myth as a way to sort of construct some of my pictures. And um, so the basic story of, of the Minotaur was that um, he's the offspring of a bull and a woman, um, but it was sort of an abomination so that he was placed at the center of a labyrinth. Um, and so I think Daedalus, Daedalus, right, the architect built the labyrinth to sort of keep him away from everything because he was growing too ferocious. And so they would send in um, sacrifices every so often, 
but nobody could find their way back out of the labyrinth. It was very difficult. So once you found your way into this center, you would be killed. Um, and so the labyrinth is most commonly described as a series of passageways and caves or chambers. Um, and so the comparison that I've made is that this area where all the igloos are is marked by all these paths, but there's a sort of lack of landmarks and all of its vegetation. It's actually really easy to get lost out there. Um, so it kind of is like a maze or like a labyrinth. It's actually so difficult to find your way around that the National Guard, they conduct training exercises out there for people to find their way through, which is strange, another sort of military exercise. Um, so I've come to view the entire place as one big labyrinth, and there are a number of these paths, all which lead to igloos, which to me represent the caves. Um, and inside one of them, there's supposed to be this mythological beast, Mothman, Minotaur, whatever you want to call it. Um, so I make a bunch of these path pictures just as a sort of structural way to talk about the labyrinth and, and the repetition. And, and you'll see that a lot of them are full of dead ends. Um, or impassable ob obstacles, so here the, the ground just sort of fell out from a, a river. And then scattered all around you as you find your way through this maze are the carcasses of all these dead animals, um, which I sort of liken to the remains of, of the people who were sacrificed. So a lot of scholars believe that, the, that there's an actual labyrinth upon which the original Greek myth is based, and it's supposed to, supposed to be based on the island of Crete. Um, and there's a particular quarry that all the rulers of Greece have gone to for hundreds of years. And so dur during the German occupation of Greece in World War II, the German army actually seized this place and used it to store explosives and munitions, which I thought was a an interesting connection. Um, and actually, when the Germans were leaving Crete, they blew it up so that the, the weapons wouldn't fall into the hands of the Greek army. So I thought there was an interesting correlation there. Um, so even though it's not sort of overt in my pictures, it's sort of underlying. And, and I think that the interesting thing about the labyrinth is, is that once once you find your way into the center, you might not like what you find, and then you also have to extricate yourself back. And so um, I use it as a sort of metaphor for war, and I guess we call it an exit strategy now, right? So even though we got to the thing that we wanted to do, now we have to find our way back. So um, I see a lot of the myth sort of informing the way that I make pictures. Um, so I should have said this, there was one guy I think it's Theseus, somebody correct me if I'm wrong, who actually ended up slaying Minotaur. He was able to do so because he was given a thread to find his way back, so he cheated. That's right, yeah. Um, so I actually made this picture. Again, it directly refers to hunting. This is like the path of blood from a, a deer that's been dragged out. But to me, I saw it as like that little thread that, that led the way back out of the maze. And this particular picture, so this is upstairs. This is the last picture that I've made in Point Pleasant, so it's the last one I'm gonna show you guys today. Um, and it depicts a lone person who's probably a hunter, sort of vaguely walking towards the edge of a field. Um, and it's uncertain, you know, where they're going, but to me it sort of represents that lone figure that was able to slay, you know, the mythological creature. Um, but I like to keep it ambiguous because, um, well, I just like it. Um, so that's it. That's the last slide. If you guys have any questions or anything. Um,